in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Ave Maria. Another reason I love this salutation, Ave Maria, is because it is about joy. It can be translated, rejoice, highly favored one. And I want to talk about joy today. We're in the month of May, which is a month of joy in our religion, but also in nature. May is a month of glory, a month of hope. It's the month of the glorious mysteries, our Lord's ascension into heaven, descent of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes Corpus Christi falls in this month. It's a time of procession. Perhaps the most beautiful title of Our Lady is Causa Letizia, cause of our joy. Joy is not mere enjoyment. People get these mixed up. Our world has lots of mere enjoyment and pleasure, but not so much joy. Joy, in our sense, comes from being alive within. It relates to the state of grace, knowing where we come from and where we're going. Do we have this joy? Sometimes it's a waiting for us in the confessional to be rekindled again. Joy is rare and hard for us in our fallen condition. I think that's why we're always better at Lent than Eastertide. It's why we're always good at keeping 40 days of Lenten rigor and not so good at keeping 50 days of joy in Eastertide. I think it's because our spirit of celebration can easily dissipate into worldliness or the pursuit of false pleasure because of our weakness. And perhaps we shy away from sustained joy for that reason. For Our Lady, it was otherwise. Let's look briefly at the joys of Mary. Joy at her birth. She brought joy into the world. She is the joy of a new creation, something unsullied, pure. She is the Immaculate Conception. Joy at the Annunciation. Rejoice, O favored one. I love the art of Blessed Fra Angelico, the patron of artists, particularly when he depicts the Annunciation. And often he, he contrasts the desert that was brought about by the first Eve, mother of all the living, with the garden of in, the incarnation brought about by the consent of the second Eve and the new creation. It's a garden that speaks of joy. Joy at the visitation. Elizabeth says to Our Lady, the child in my womb leapt for joy. The sound of your voice. Grace operative. And it's there too that Our Lady sings her great hymn of joy. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Christ brings true joy, and, but it is through Our Lady. We just sang the Ave Verum, that beautiful motet, hail true body sprung from the virgin's womb. Joy at Bethlehem, at the manifestation of the Word made flesh. Mothers always instinctively feel joy at the appearing of their children into the world, but how much more so with Mary and the appearing of our Lord. Are you familiar with the hymn, Daily, Daily, Sing to Mary? There's a line in that hymn, all our joys do flow from Mary. And it comes from St. Bernard of Clairvaux, that line. And some people say, oh, it's exaggerated because Christ causes our joy. But he comes and chooses to come into the world through the consent of Our Lady. She's chosen and chooses to be the cause of our joy. Joy at seeing our Lord grow 
in wisdom and grace before God and man. We rejoice to see young people develop their skills and talents. You rejoice to see your children grow and do great things. How much more so with Mary and our Lord? Joy as Our Lady sees her son set in motion the reign of heaven on earth in his public ministry. Every mother of a priest will know something of that joy. But you might be thinking, but Father, you're not telling the whole story. You're being selective. There is an admixture of sorrow in this story too. Do we not pray the Dola Rosary? The seven sorrows of Mary are very significant too. Unimaginable grief, particularly at the cross, and unparalleled sadness Our Lady must have felt at the rejection of her son. How can she have joy in the veil of tears? Even amidst terrible sufferings, Our Lady knew that all would be well, that Christ would triumph. More than that, not just would triumph in the future tense, but that he already was the triumph. He said, I am the resurrection and the life, even before his crucifixion. And while the apostles doubted this, Our Lady would never. Her joy was a constant. And in comparison with the sufferings she endured, far greater. The sufferings came and went. They wouldn't last forever, but the joy would remain constant and would last forever. How much greater then is her joy at the resurrection of our Lord in the flesh three on the third day after his death. A joy that can never be taken from her. And yes, she had great sadness and setbacks, even during her final years of life on earth, before her glorious assumption. But she knew and taught the disciples how to have joy in the veil of tears. Causa Laetitiae, in this valley of sorrows. And we need that message too. It's a vital message because, and I'm speaking of this today, we can feel weighed down and quite heavy with all the challenges that face us, the assaults of evil, both personal but also societal. I've already spoken of the specter of the culture of death, but also secularism that pushes religion to the corners of our society and even treats it as hostile. That spirit of godlessness, of atheism, that claims the souls of our children and offers them nothing, no hope in return. We face many weighty challenges, but so did Our Lady, and her joy remains throughout. The Rosary is a prayer of joy, it begins with the Ave, which is a greeting of joy. And while it acknowledges sin and death and the need for powerful intercession, it is fundamentally a song of joy. The sorrowful mysteries are outweighed by the joyful, the luminous, and the glorious. And have you ever noticed that when groups of people pray the rosary, like today, and like the rosary on the coast at the weekend, and probably on the March for Life today, there was a sense of joy and jubilation, even when matters serious were being confronted and dealt with. People have always prayed the rosary with a certain joy, even in times of pestilence and famine and indeed war. The rosary surprisingly has been the devotion chosen to confront great threats to Christian civilization. You know about the origin of the Feast of the Holy Rosary itself. It came because of the Battle of Lepanto and Pope Pius V called on the whole Christian world to pray the rosary to save Christendom as it was being attacked and under the threat of invasion. And after the Second World War, the bishops of Austria called all the Austrian people to pray the rosary with a certain confidence and joy. 
There was a real danger that Austria would be divided or become part of the Soviet bloc, and people feared this. And a national rosary campaign was the catalyst for a surprising change. And I want to mention a lesser known story here in England, Our Lady's Dowry, from this cathedral in May 1940. Cardinal Hinsley responded to King George's call for a day of national prayer. Hinsley's buried right across from me here in the chapel of St. George. That his cardinal's hat is hovering above his, uh, his tomb. Uh, Jerry, in just a few moments ago, took me there because I said I'd be mentioning him in this sermon, and I said a prayer for him. But he was a man of great caliber in those war years. Churchill called him my cardinal. He was not a man of appeasement. He was not a man of compromise. He was not a, a man to give up on the gospel, even if it required great challenges. And he urged Churchill to keep fighting to prevent Hitler from overtaking Europe. He proposed to the people here from Westminster, but throughout this nation, the rosary on a vast scale unknown before. And millions of Catholics responded and pledged themselves to pray the rosary every day. And more than that, the call was to pray the rosary with arms outstretched. Have you ever seen this before? Arms were to be outstretched almost like Moses, who stretched out his arm and, until all the Israelites had passed across the sea. And there was a movement called Chains of the Rosary. About 144 people um, would divide a whole day into minutes so that the rosary would be prayed perpetually in parishes. People undertook certain times of the day. And what followed we know is a great event. It's called the Miracle of Dunkirk, as attributed to Our Lady. As you know, people throughout the country prayed, but no one more than the Catholics praying those rosaries. Suddenly, despite apparent disaster, hundreds of fishing boats went across the channel to rescue soldiers at Dunkirk. Instead of having to announce the capture and deaths of thousands, Churchill could turn the event into something strangely positive and rallying. A change of weather after the evacuation prevented the German army from pursuing over land and sea. It was in the minds of many another exodus. And even more strangely, Hitler decided not to invade this land when it was at its weakest. Evil always seems to be winning. It always looks powerful and mighty. But there are other things at work. This was the last time our whole nation really prayed together. And Our Lady surely interceded and may have changed the course of history. We call this whole operation, don't we? Operation Dynamo. Well, brothers and sisters, we have our own dynamo, our blessed lady, and an operation that can change the course of history. We need that again. Do not underestimate the power of prayer, the power of the Holy Rosary. We are in Easter tide, in the Paschal tide, and we have to keep reminding ourselves of the cause of our joy, that victory is won, we sing in Easter hymns, battle is over, hell's armies flee. We can keep singing the song, the new song, Alleluia, because our Lord is truly risen. He has already won. And what we're doing now is rescuing as many people, including ourselves, for the victory. Joy in overall confidence is added to by each soul won back for Christ. The March for Life that has taken place today, if dedicated to God, especially through the hands of Our Lady, is an unstoppable march. It is a march of the resurrection. It is of life and it will prevail. That is certain. And let our supernatural hope be the cause of our confidence. 
May is the month of joy and of hope. A century and a half ago, John Henry Newman marveled at the revival of things in nature during this season. But he marveled even more at the supernatural grace at work in the revival of the church in our land. He saw a church of a few underground Catholics become a church of several million people by the end of his life. The resurrection from the dead is possible here too. He attributed the sudden resurrection of the English church to Mary's intercession. And I want to leave you with his prayer, so filled with Marian devotion, with joy, and with hope. Arise, make haste, my love, my dove, my beautiful one, and come, for the winter is now past, and the rain is over and gone. The flowers have appeared in our land. The fig tree has put forth her green figs. The vines in flower yield their sweet smell. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come. It is the time for thy visitation. Arise, Mary, and go forth in thy strength into that north country, which was once thine own, and take possession of a land which knows thee not. Arise, Mother of God, and with thy thrilling voice, Speak to those who labor with child and are in pain till the babe of grace leaps within them. Shine on us, dear lady, with thy bright countenance, like the sun in his strength, O Stella Matutina, O harbinger of peace, till our year is one perpetual May. From thy sweet eyes, from thy pure smile, from thy majestic brow, Let 10,000 influences rain down, not to confound or overwhelm, but to persuade, to win over thine enemies. O Mary, my hope, O Mother undefiled, fulfill to us the promise of this spring. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, cause of our joy. Our Lady, protectress of the unborn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Ave Maria. Ave Maria.